Thank you. It's great. I, I love the spirit within which this course is taught. Um, the kind of approach and methods taken in this course is very exciting and inspiring. And uh, you're all very lucky to be able to indulge this kind of uh, freedom, intellectual freedom, to kind of take this one uh, event in history and riff off of it, looking for resonances around the whole world throughout time in ways that right, uh, rightfully should uh, influence your career choices. And um, uh, it reminds me why, when I got a chance to teach an elective last, a few years ago, I said I wanted to teach a course that I called Design in the Anthropocene, which I don't know if you talked about the term Anthropocene. Um, but in the end, we were looking for the most pragmatic uh, measures possible to quantify impacts on climate change and work them into a constant feedback system through cell phones. We were actually designing apps for cell phones in teams such that every decision one makes over the course of a day would not just register how much money it costs you, but also register its impact on your share of the wealth of the planet. And it starts from the premise that um, if we're heading quickly towards a 10 billion person world, that's peak human population within your lifetimes, uh, let's just design for that. And let's divide the asset value of the planet evenly uh, by 10 billion, and so we can keep track of each person's share value of the asset value of the planet, and you can track it on your phone and see it go up and down depending on uh, whether you uh, buy a car and drive it everywhere you go or do something else, or et cetera. And so it's a very pragmatic uh, speculation on something that we could do. But I'm not going to talk about that. This is more about um, using the intellectual freedom of the, of the approach of this class to say, okay, Tambora, 1815, uh, what else is going on in and around that moment? Uh, and this is me saying, well, Tambora is uh, two islands away from Bali and three islands away from Java. And some really interesting things are going on in Java uh, at the time, and since, and before. And I just recently presented um, a paper in Japan about the connections between the Netherlands and their colonies uh, on the islands of Java, Bali, etc. cetera. Um, all of these islands were colonized by the Dutch. But the starting point for my research was uh, was I was I was doing uh, research on real estate developments in the city of Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, on the island of Java, three islands away from Sumbawa, um, and I noticed that there was an extreme social stratification that was part of the real estate uh, plan. So they they took the gated community. Uh, model of the United States, especially as developed in Southern California, and they said, let's do that. So they created the rules, the laws in the 1970s that allowed them to have a real estate market. So it's all of a sudden land had value. Previously it hadn't. Uh, and since then, China has done the same thing, and a lot of its economic explosion has been because it created a land property um, economy market. Um, and so Indonesia did the same thing a few years earlier. <clears throat> and they built all these gated communities. And they were controlling. And here, uh, since I was presenting in Japan, I was showing how they use Japanese themes to, to sell real estate. So this is the Ise Shrine, the most famous temple in Japan, used as a gatehouse for this gated community. Um, and really strictly using barriers to keep out uh, the non-wealthy. And 
it struck me that the entire structure of this plan for the town uh, comes with a series of gates and controlling how people move through and who's allowed to move through, despite the fact that they had this incredibly progressive rule. Um, we in the United States have this thing called inclusionary zoning, where in the city of Boston, if you're building uh, a, a building or a development with 30 units or more, I think the rule is 15% of the units need to be for uh, low income, uh, need to be affordable housing. And um, that's great, but this was an even more dramatic thing. Uh, this is, if you want to build uh, housing development, 90% of the units need to be affordable. Um, and so I thought that was brilliant. And when I was asking around, my friends were saying, oh yeah, that's impractical. Um, no one will ever do that. But it was a law. And I said, well, how do they get around the law? And basically, the developers pay off the politicians uh, for the equivalent of the cost of the 90% of the houses. And they just built these, they just built these luxury developments with all, all the ones and none of the nine. And the nine money changes hand with the idea that the nine will be built somewhere else, and um, it never gets built. Um, in Boston, too? In Boston, um, there are other tricks. Um, but in Boston, it's 15%. I live at the one AB Ritz Tower, the Ritz Carlton, and they have all those residences in like, other locations. Yes, so they're doing the same tricks here. Um, in New York City, they say, well, you can't. It has to be in the building. So they said, well, let's make a different entrance. So down by the truck ramp, there's an entrance for the affordable units, and then everybody else comes in through the front door. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of a common issue. Uh, but I thought it was very interesting that even my close colleagues, my collaborators in Indonesia, uh, who are otherwise very progressive and intelligent and into issues of social justice said, well, it's really not fair uh, because of so you're just inviting social jealousy. You can't have poor people coming into the uh, walking past the one luxury house, the nine, nine families walking past the one luxury house. It just makes them feel sad. And I'd say, no, they all have good water supply. They have good roads. They all have good schools and access to shopping, access to transportation. But I never got any traction on this argument, so it still bothers me many years later. Um, so I'm looking into this, like what is going on here? Why is this such an acceptable approach to, uh, to continue and proliferate and propagate this kind of social stratification? Uh, and I went to a shopping mall to um, get a tripod for my camera, and before I could go in by, uh, to shop for the tripod, I had to show my ID to these three young gentlemen, and um, they were just confirming that I am wealthy and white, uh, and thus qualified to enter their shopping mall. Um, and so this was a, a, a checkpoint that allowed me to come in, but not others, um, which reminded me of everything I knew about the history of uh, Grand Apartheid uh, South Africa. You may have heard of it, uh, but from 1948 to 1994, uh, there were pass laws. Uh, people had to carry, uh, non-whites had to carry a book, uh, and every month their employer had to sign it. And if, the empl if they didn't have an up-to-date uh, signature for that month, then they were subject to imprisonment, and the only way out of prison would be to agree to a nine to 12 month contract that would, was basically the equivalent of slave labor. Um, and so here these guys know that their passbook is out of date and they're, so they're hiding from the police with the help of the photographer who, when he took this photograph, actually distracted the police and so the police did not catch these guys. Anyway, South Africa, have you heard of this? So, um, the common thread here is that the Dutch, who are famously tolerant of multiple, originally it was tolerant of you know, Catholics and Protestants and let's all get along after the horrific 
experience of the Eighty Years' War um, in Europe. Um, but the Dutch uh, are famously tolerant, even though it's illegal, they tolerate the uh, smoking of pot and hash in the coffee shops of uh, Amsterdam, et cetera. So, but it's a, it's a famously tolerant uh, society, yet their colonial experience is very different. The Dutch are the ones who invented apartheid. Uh, it's a Dutch word. They're the ones who settled in Cape Town, in South Africa, established it as a refueling stop for their ships going to the Spice Islands in Indonesia. Um, and so uh, this led me to look at the roots of an apartheid system, not in South Africa, but in Indonesia, on the island of Java, where the Dutch burned down uh, a fishing village. Uh, in, they were battling the local sultan, and they were battling against the British, and they needed a, a headquarters, a, a, a fortified port in the area of the Spice Islands uh, to operate their colonial uh, the largest, uh, the first and largest multinational corporation in history, the Dutch East India Company. And so they took the excuse of this skirmish, or this three-way skirmish, they burned the fishing village to the ground and built uh, a new city called Batavia, which is now Jakarta. And they built Batavia around the same time as they massively expanded Amsterdam. And so one of the ideas that I've was promoting in this paper was that Batavia and Amsterdam are really the north and south sides of the same city. It was the wealth flowing from the Spice Islands, 21,000 kilometers uh, by ship to the port of Amsterdam. It was that wealth that produced Amsterdam. And so these two towns were both based on the uh, fortification and logistical model of Simon's uh, Steven, this brilliant uh, engineer. Um, and so this is the city of Batavia built on the, the ruins of the burned fishing village. Um, and it's much closer to the ideal because it was built from scratch in 1619. So we're talking about 1619, uh, 200 years before the events of Tambora. Um, but really, these are almost simultaneous uh, image maps. Um, and at the end, I'm going to come back to what's going on here with this and uh, all the letters and numbers that are in these blocks. Because this is uh, really interesting in that sometimes you're just, a map is just a map. You want to be able to find your way around. But other times, a map is much more than a map. Uh, and so that's kind of the, um, the question I'm looking at. What is this map really for? And so um, one of the things I also uncovered is that at almost about the same time, you have these paintings that show the center of Amsterdam, its key institutions, the new town hall, the new church, the, the Vag, the, the Way House, the uh, standards of weights and measures. Uh, for the marketplace, which is happening here, the fish market here, and just off the painting, out of the frame, is the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which uh, is a fascinating topic that I looked at uh, last year in another project I did. Um, but about the same time, the marketplace and key institution, to institutional arrangements at the center of Amsterdam uh, is painted almost the same year as uh, the same scene, the equivalent scene in Batavia, where you have the market, the marketplace with all its people, the fortifications at the port of the canal city of Batavia. Uh, and so the greatest attention in both paintings are on these cast of characters. Uh, and so it's a similar approach to two ends of this trade network being operated by the largest multinational corporation. Um, and so if you look closely at the people, you can tell who they are. This is a Spaniard uh, demonstrating that even though they fought uh, a revolution against Spanish, the Spanish throne for uh, decades prior to this, no hard feelings. Uh, we still want to trade with the Spanish. 
And here's uh, a portrait of uh, a fashionable couple. Um, the silk is, was a, a, a recent innovation. This was a typical Dutch male costume uh, called drach, which was uh, emulating the color of dead leaves. You know, it, was, it was important to not call attention to yourself in Dutch society at the time, um, etc. Um, here's the Dutch, uh, the Amsterdam Exchange, where uh, it was the original open market. Uh, at each column and at each archway, they would gather to trade a specific commodity. So these gentlemen, uh, I didn't look up what they're trading, but um, they're, I have the map that shows if you want to trade in lumber, or if you want to rent out your attic storage space, or if you want to trade in spices, you, you gather at a different location in this open courtyard. And by pulling together the greatest number of sellers and the greatest number of buyers for any given commodity, those of you who understand economics, how many of you have, have you taken the economics course here? So if you get the, the most number of buyers and the most number of sellers together at one place in time, you can bid up and down the tr and find the true market value of any commodity. And because Amsterdam had this place with the greatest number of buyers and the greatest number of sellers in all of Europe for, during the 17th century, they could establish the commodity prices, print them up in sheets, and send them on ships all over Europe. And so the prices of everything uh, in Europe were set in, in this space. Um, and they used um, certain rules of, of dress and behavior, no spitting, no swearing, no fisticuffs, uh, no shouting, no brawling, no women, no children. Um, they would not have allowed dogs, and that, that's a mistake. Um, and uh, by controlling what people are wearing, controlling how people are behaving, controlling who can be here, they are, they are using these methods to establish trust amongst uh, traders. Because once you establish trust, you can then uh, make exchanges by paper. So instead of saying, I have uh, a barrel of fish here, or I have a shipload of fish, come see it, they could say, I have a fish load of ship, uh, a fish in the harbor, and trust me, you want it at this price, we'll do it by paper. And so paper transactions were the crucial thing to create the Dutch East India Company and all corporations. Yes? Was there an easy way to distinguish between like, the buyer and the seller? Because in this picture, the man with the red cape looks like um, a more wealthier, per uh, like a wealthier person. But then previously, you had mentioned that uh, the Dutch or the Amsterdam uh, like, typical costume for males would be yeah, it was a tough thing. Um, there was a general disdain for superfluous displays of wealth. But at the same time, uh, because it was uh, not cool to be flashy, they would express uh, the, the, the display of wealth became more and more subtle. So the buttons would become the opportunity to display wealth. And there was a struggle throughout the 17th century, and near the end is the wealth. This was the golden age because of all the, the wealth flowing into uh, Dutch ports from the spice trades, especially. Uh, that they, it started to get out of hand, and so they passed rules. They said, you can only wear something like this if you're of a certain status. And so uh, they started to open it up, but it was strictly controlled. And so these were called sumptuary codes. And there were actual laws that dictated the materials that you could have on your buckles of your shoes, or your buttons, or other things. And it would have controlled, I think, I'm not sure on why the red cape here, um, but it, it, it comes up, this is the key issue that comes up in the paintings as we look closer. But that's an excellent question. And so a similar thing is happening in these paintings of the harbors, or of the marketplaces uh, at the harbors, 
where um, in both cases people are segregated in their homes and neighborhoods, but uh, the one place where you see all of humanity, the cross-section of who's who, you see them in the marketplace. And so uh, these are the Chinese, uh, there's a Chinese beggar and the Chinese, uh, uh, and the Chinese in, uh, throughout the trading networks that the Dutch were opening up were the most stratified. Um, so uh, the different rankings of the different Chinese characters uh, that we see, and there aren't many in this portrait, but the different rankings are extremely uh, stratified. So there are uh, Chinese the equivalent of slaves, uh, and then there are Chinese that were much wealthier than the Dutch colonial officers themselves. And um, in part because some of the Chinese were wealthier and more powerful than the Dutch overseers of the port city, uh, that caused a problem. And so they had to, um, they started out with sumptuary codes in Batavia that were aimed at the Dutch saying, you have to, we're, we're, we're all Dutch and we're all gonna be treated as one level uh, and all the same. Um, and that was the first generation of sumptuary codes in 1640. But after that, because of the competition with the Chinese and the extreme stratification of the Chinese and the other uh, indigenous groups that were collected together in this port city, the Dutch had to start to compete. And so the rules, uh, when they reformed, when they revised these sumptuary codes in later decades, they became increasingly permissive of these other symbols of uh, wealth and status to the point where uh, it started to get more and more uh, prescriptive of not just the Dutch costume, but also uh, the Chinese costume uh, the Balinese costumes, the Ambonese, the, the, the Sundanese, the Javanese, because the Dutch, in order to con keep control of this population of this port town, with just a handful of Dutch officers, they had to make sure that uh, there was no significant singular majority group, which is this, it's familiar as a strategy because that's exactly what they did in South Africa. They didn't say white South Africans and black South Africans. They said white South Africans, 10% of the population. And then they said um, Zulu. And they said, uh, and then they went down the Bantu, the, the Bantu the, which was a derogatory term. But they divided the non-white population into ever smaller tribal groupings to the point where the white, uh, surprise, surprise, the white identity was the, was the largest single group. And so it wasn't white, non-white, it was white as the largest group, 10%, and all these tiny little tribal uh, different groups um, that were all smaller than the white group. And so the, the, the Dutch in Batavia did the exact same thing. And they, um, they restricted the movements of different uh, population groups to make sure that there was no majority that was larger than the Dutch. And they did that by subdividing the Chinese population, which was by far the largest category of citizen in Batavia. Even though they were, this is not China, um, it just happened to dominate. And there are several versions of this painting um, that show the groups slightly differently. This is a Japanese Christian stranded here during the 200 years of isolation. Um, and I used it to identify um, who really painted this version of it. Um, this is the actual painting by Bakeman because he traveled to Japan, painted this Japanese Christian, and he, this is a much closer match to what Bakeman actually found. But this painting hung in the, the main meeting hall of the, the 17 board of trustees of the Dutch East India Company, and it showed uh, an orderly colony. It showed that the governor general is leaving the fortress and going to the town hall with his entourage, 
It showed the warehouses gleaming in the sun. It showed the, the Hall of Justice with a, a prison and a gallows. You can't really see it in the slide. It showed uh, ships being built, uh, the, the smoke from the chimney of the smithery so that they were producing uh, the fittings for the ship industry, the orderliness of trade. We can identify all the different groups uh, of who's who and see that everything is in order so that they don't have to travel all the way to Batavia to, make, to check on things. They could just look up from their meeting and see how orderly everything is um, up on the wall. And so um, one of the key things is, is here where, again, we see this fashionable couple, typical for uh, Batavia at the time, so a Dutch gentleman with a Javanese wife. Um, and the umbrella is actually against the law of the sumptuary because uh, unless you are the governor general or a member of the governor general's council. Uh, and if, if you're not in that group, the sumptuary codes that were passed uh, in the later generation uh, said, would say that you can't have a servant carrying your umbrella. You have to carry your own umbrella because the servant carrying the umbrella behind is a symbol of status. And that symbol of status is, doesn't come from any Dutch practices. It actually comes from local practices on the island of Java. And so this is kind of the, the link um, to uh, big part of the big source of insight um, into this topic. That when the Dutch came to the island of Java, uh, the, the king of Java, who's here, this is Paco Buono X, uh, in order to uh, work productively with the more powerful Dutch, the king uh, left his sarong in his uh, his traditional outfit, and he embraced the Dutch outfit, including the military medals, the sash, the hat, pants, and shoes. Um, and this is actually um, Chula Longkorn, the uh, king of uh, Siam uh, at the time, showing even though Siam was never colonized, Thailand was never colonized by the British, it was extremely influenced by uh, British power, and so there was uh, a similar attempt to assimilate the practices of Europeans. Um, and here you see him in another view. But the interesting thing is here, you see the umbrellas. Not only um, this is the same king of Java later, he's gained some weight. Um, but not only uh, is, is the, the umbrella, the payum, uh, the ceremonial umbrella showing the wealth and status of the king. It's also being um, embraced by the Dutch. And so this symbol of power is embraced by the Dutch. Uh, it isn't just a one-way thing where the Javanese uh, defer to the, the more powerful Dutch and embrace a lot of their cultural practices, but there's also the reciprocal embrace of Javanese practices by the Dutch. And uh, one of the reasons why I was able to notice this is because um, after I graduated from architecture school, there was an economic downturn. Uh, and long story short, I accepted a three-month grant to go to the island of Java and to do research on the architecture of this one city based on this photograph that a friend sent me from her visit to the same city, I thought that looks interesting. This tense, intensely urbanized neighborhood, and then through the gate, this lush garden. Um, and so that was the photo that really kind of caught my attention. And I got there, and uh, I started talking, and I spent the night in, inside this gate. And then I got to talking to people, and they said, oh yeah, this is a typical Javanese mansion, noble house. It's a miniature version of the palace. And I said, palace? And they said, yeah, palace. Just go out to the right and turn around the corner. And, and I, I came to the palace. Um, so it turns out there was a palace. And I saw um, P. 
people going in and out of this gate. And I said, who are they? And he said, oh yeah, that was the princess. I said, princess? There's a princess? So yeah, there's lots of princesses. There's 35 princes and princesses of the palace. And one thing led to another, and I became, uh, for four years, I ended up staying, uh, the architect to the king of Java um, in the 90s. Uh, and so um, what I learned is that there are these, still these dress coats. If you want to come through this gate, you have to wear this sash. Uh, and uh, if you're not wearing the sash, you can't come through the gate. And there are guards who will keep you from entering the gate. So as we did research work on the, the palace, all of my research assistants had to wear the sash. And I always had to wear the sash. Um, as I did work um, trying to document this, and this is the, the master builder priest of the palace um, who also wears the sash. Uh, he is the holy master builder who, when uh, the most sacred buildings need repair, he performs the religious ceremonies in order to do what he's doing here, which is replace a column uh, of this tower. Uh, and the research I did uh, led to uh, the ability to document the palace uh, in a way that they had felt um, they didn't want people to know what the palace layout was because it was considered strategic information. But um, there was enough aerial photography around. They agreed to this, uh, and so we were able to produce and publish this depiction of the palace. Um, and as we did renovation work, I, I became a fundraiser, and we found funding to uh, do work on the palace. Because any money that was available to the king um, in the post-revolutionary years after 1945, after World War II, it was he, all of the land holdings, and there were six major industrial uh, operations they were confiscated and taken over by the uh, new government of Indonesia. And so they basically uh, were impoverished. And whatever money they had, they put into the continuing practice of the religious rituals. Because the religious rituals were responsible for maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. Um, and so when we were about to start our renovation work, um, we had to wait for the right date, as, as determined by the priest. And we had to perform certain ceremonies um, to make sure nothing went wrong. So here's um, the master builder with his sash uh, in both cases. But here he is in his ceremonial uh, religious garb. And there he is. He's at work. Um, and we were actually able to host the 1995 Aga Khan Award for Architecture in the palace after doing uh, the renovation work. Um, and there's His Highness the Aga Khan, the head of the Ismaili sect of Islam, the king, the minister of culture, and that's me uh, as a translator so that the king and the, His Highness uh, the Aga Khan and the king could talk to each other. Um, the famous uh, the way we look at these things is uh, when the Dutch arrived, the Javanese embraced a whole bunch of cultural practices, including the brass band, the Baroque architecture. But even before that, uh, they embraced Islam when it came in the 13th century. They embraced uh, this Ottoman thing. They, this is a, a Dutch tails coat that, uh, because they have to wear a sword in the back, they snipped off the tails so the tails didn't stick up. And that became the standard um, ceremonial outfit. This Dutch Baroque carriage was a gift from the uh, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. And you see offerings every Thursday, uh, on the eve of Thursday, so every Wednesday night, uh, offerings would be made because this had been in the palace so long that it took on a spiritual a role in the maintenance of order in the universe. Um, similarly, uh, before Islam, there was uh, all of Java was Hindu 
Hindu Buddhist animist uh, mixture. Syncretism uh, is when these things get merged all together. So here is a, a photo that I took, uh, but it could have been taken uh, 100 or 200, well, there wasn't photography 200 years before that, but uh, it could have been at any point uh, because these practices were left over from the Hindu Javanese uh, system, the linga and yoni, the symbol of male and female genitalia. But here they are as part of the Islamic celebration of the Grebeg um, uh, celebration of one of the three uh, Islamic holidays. And so it's, it's not the kind of thing you would see in any other circumstance, this kind of mixture of Islam and Hinduism. And here um, they are being paraded out of the palace through the central square. So this is the most sacred center of the palace. And they take them out. So that, that black and white photograph was taken right here in this building. Um, they would remove it. It was made in the kitchen, produced here, paraded out with the king, down the ceremony, access to here, and then into the mosque, the grand mosque, the official mosque of the kingdom. Uh, and there, there's the mosque. <clears throat> and there they were, prayers would, would be said in Arabic uh, in the mosque. And then people tear it apart uh, because it's got sacred stuff. And you grab it, you take it home. And when your children are sick, you crumble a little bit of it into their cereal. Here's the king uh, coming through the center of the palace uh, with his... Uh, umbrella uh, coming behind him so you see it in action. Um, and so the, I was able to recognize uh, some of these cultural practices uh, in my research into <coughs> Batavia and Amsterdam because it was something I experienced during the course of four years uh, during my, my work in the palace um, for this king. And um, uh, one of the really interesting things is that the palace itself is not that opulent. It's not very palatial. There's not a lot of gold and uh, monumentality. But what it is, is it's, it's most interesting thing is it acts as a model of the Hindu Javanese cosmos. And the palace itself is an instrument for uh, establishing and sustaining the balance between heaven and earth. And so uh, if something like a volcanic eruption occurred uh, in one part of the kingdom, the, the corresponding location in the palace would be the site of a ceremony to restore the balance. Um, the imbalance is what causes things like civil unrest, drought, famine, and volcanic uh, eruptions. Um, and <clears throat> Every place in the palace uh, has a different level. And so the stratification of social persons, you know, their bodies are, uh, it's partly encoded in the dress, but it's also encoded in behavior. So um, the closer you get to the center of the palace and the king, uh, the, the more you have to alter what you're wearing and how you speak and how you behave. And at every threshold in the palace, uh, there are guards to make sure that you are doing the right things. You're wearing the right things, you're behaving the right way, and you're capable, you're, that you deserve access. So it's a lot like the passcodes of South Africa. Um, and there's a mirror to the right and the left, and you look in the mirror on the right, and you check your outer appearance to make sure everything is in place. Uh, and you look in the mirror on the left, and you check your inner state. You see if your state of mind is calm and refined, and you are uh, qualified to enter into the next level, uh, the center of which uh, is where the king is at. And so uh, chairs go away, shoes go away. You have to leave your shoes, uh, and you have to um, squat, uh, you may have already past that part where people are approaching the king and they have to duck walk 
uh, you have to have good knees and you have to be able to duck walk as you approach because that's what the space requires. And so there's this very complex hierarchy that is spatially uh, dictated. Uh, it's the costume, it's the language. The Javanese language has multiple levels um, uh, uh, that are correspond with levels of respect. And there's a separate vocabulary. Uh, like you would never talk to the king, have you eaten yet today, and use the same word for eat as you would uh, in high Javanese. The king himself has his own word. And you need to know all of these different language levels uh, in addressing the king. <clears throat> um, and so all of these people, and you, you see the common hand position, this is dictated by this system of stratification, social stratification. Um, and so it's recognizable that um, James Riotti, who you might have heard his name because uh, he made illegal campaign contributions to Bill Clinton's presidential campaign. Um, his house, he's the developer of this, and he designed this as kind of his own palace. Uh, surrounded by uh, the, the nobles and princes and princesses of his own personal kingdom. And so his house was on an island. I don't know if that's it. But uh, it's very much informed by this hierarchy of space. And if you are rich enough, you can buy a place and it gives you access here. If you're even richer, you get access here, if you're even richer, access here, closer and closer to the center of the gated community complex. Um, and if you're not rich at all, you only get to go to the shopping mall, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so the, the spatial arrangement, there are similar characteristics between the real, the gated community, the palace, and the layout of Batavia. And now back to the map. Uh, if you zoom in um, to the map, you see that every building in one neighborhood is numbered. And those numbers correspond basically to a directory. And this is the map is not just a, a way of navigating the city. The map is also a, a directory that indicates the social hierarchy of the, of the town. So this is the fanciest neighborhood of Batavia, where the Dutch officers would live, um, typically with their Javanese uh, or Chinese wives, uh, because it was difficult to bring Dutch uh, women to Batavia because it was so hot and so much malaria and so much death and disease um, that they tended to marry locals. Um, but this is the kind of who's who in the year 1667. Uh, and similarly, these neighborhoods, which are much less specific, give us a sense of the different uh, categories of the Chinese um, were allocated a different block. And so each of the groups, uh, the ethnic, uh, the racial occupation uh, based categories of, of human would be in each of these neighborhood locations under the supervision of uh, an officer. And so this was a divide and conquer situation. And this was the main kind of um, headquarters for the Dutch uh, military presence so that they could keep control. And the other thing that's really interesting is that um, the canals here, which are a way to get the barges and the goods in and out of Batavia operating very similar in, the, in this neighborhood as they operated in Amsterdam, where there's lots of bridges so that there's lots of interconnectivity so that you can move through this space. But then over here, the canals are acting as barriers. They're basically uh, operating as uh, moats, keeping people from moving from one place to another unless they pass through these checkpoints. So these would be controlled. And instead of presenting a passbook to say, I have permission to go through here, 
the passbook was not a, a document that they would produce. The passbook was their clothing and their appearance uh, as dictated by the sumptuary codes of Batavia. And so uh, these portraits are, are not just celebrating uh, the, the achievement of the location, but also the orderliness where you can instantaneously read who is who and who would have rights to enter the fortress, uh, passing this checkpoint of the guard here, the, another checkpoint um, for crossing over the bridge. And so at every point, it's demonstrating a high level of control of space and an orderliness, despite the fact there are very few Dutch uh, officers uh, maintaining the operation of this colonial project. So any questions at that point? That's kind of where the, um, the paper I presented ends um, that I presented in Japan last week. Now, yes, yeah. sure. This is an amazing uh, way to think about sister cities. Um, so let's see, first. Were, were there punishments, do you know, for wearing the wrong clothing? Um, you know, wearing clothes above your class, or did you, or was this sort of just bought into as part of your identity, you just wouldn't do that? Well, it was uh, not just the Dutch enforcing this, it was actually, it already existed centuries before the Dutch showed up. So the Dutch, uh, identified these practices and said, oh, that's handy. We can build on this system. Just like um, Europeans didn't invent slavery, we just expanded it by a thousand times. Um, you know, it was just that this is a useful practice, let's do this. And 18 million slaves later, you have the whole slavery thing. It's a similar operation where uh, the Chinese are already self-enforcing self internally for their own reasons these very strict codes of appearance and hierarchy within Chinese society and the Javanese, uh, as um, my experience suggests. And the Dutch are saying, okay, that works for us. We already have these sumptuary codes. We were using it to level the social playing field amongst the Dutch. But those same codes can be altered slightly and used to reinforce a highly stratified hierarchy of social uh, stratification. So same tools um, ad adapted for instrumental purposes to keep the whole machine running. Yes. That's a good question. Um, the only thing I, we could point to is in the paintings, they're often depicting um, bodies hanging from the gallows for whatever misbehavior. And sometimes it was two or three to set an example. In 1740, uh, it got out of hand. Um, and uh, over the course of five days, they hung 500 Chinese, uh, and then it escalated, and they ended up uh, massacring uh, over 10,000 Chinese. And that was in, in 1741, and that was the beginning of the end of the Dutch East India Company. So the king of Java at that time uh, forged an alliance with the Chinese. They started a rebellion with the goal of ejecting the Dutch out of Java, and uh, the Dutch fought wars uh, from 1741 until it bankrupted the corporation. And by 1795, the Dutch East India Company uh, dissolved and the Dutch government took over. And so um, it, 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 they managed to keep it under control until 1741 when the oppressive practices uh, and the paranoia really, the thing that really uh, changed in 1741 
is the fear of the Chinese. There were so many Chinese uh, workers, and there was such a profound fear that uh, a, a Dutch officer snapped uh, and started killing Chinese, and then there was no turning back. Um, and so that was 50 years of warfare and uh, the end of the Dutch East India Company. Yeah. Um, I know you touched on it like, fairly briefly, but since how China was heavily involved, as well as the Dutch, um, how involved was Japan in terms of Java? <clears throat> Japan was, uh, in 1639, Japan said, uh, this is, enough's enough. These goddamn Portuguese and Dutch missionaries, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Silence? Who saw that? Yeah, with um, the guy who plays um, in Star Wars. Ah. Driver. Adam Driver? Adam Driver is in this movie that came out about a year ago. And it's about the missionaries in Japan, uh, where there are enough Christians in Japan at one point that they uh, mount a rebellion against the emperor and the shogun state, the shogunate. And so the Japanese say, enough's enough. Everybody get out, all you Europeans. And they make it against the law to have a ship that doesn't have a hull designed to flood as soon as you leave the harbor. So for, from 1639 on, there's no contact, virtually no contact between Japan and the outside world. So no Japanese, except for the, Dutch, uh, the Japanese Christians who are exiled as part of that isolation policy. And it's only broken when the US decides it wants to force Japan into a trade arrangement in 1853. Um, so for over 200 years, Japan is absolutely isolated. So not much happening the Japanese. The Chinese, uh, uh, China is not acting as a state. It's just uh, from the first centuries, uh, of the common era, like the year 100 onward, especially from the south uh, east coast of China, uh, they find it extremely profitable to send family members throughout the South China Sea region. And so there are enclaves of Chinese uh, residents in every port town in the Philippines, in Brunei, in Malaysia, Singapore, uh, all throughout what we now call Indonesia, there's always a port with an enclave of Chinese residents who may have been there for centuries. At this point, I had Chinese friends in Indonesia whose families had been there for over 500 years, but they were all considered foreigners still. Um, uh, and these, this was not a state operation. This was simply good business. Um, to have trading partners uh, of Chinese through the Chinese network, overseas networking, uh, as trade partners going back and forth throughout throughout the region, and they so that's in part why the Chinese were so instrumental in keeping the flow of goods uh, in the Dutch trade system, because they were perfectly happy to take their cut and let the Dutch take the rest. Um, and so the Dutch found it advantageous to just hook in and control the Chinese trade networks because that's, that's who actually made it happen. They couldn't do anything without the cooperation of the Chinese, and that's why things fell apart after 1741. The, the corporation was never profitable after that. An embassy? No. It, it, gets, just like it was like Chinatown. I mean, the same thing happened in this country, Chinatown. You know, they would stick together. Once someone from this village had established themselves in San Francisco or in Batavia or anywhere else, uh, they were the connection, and that town or village uh, would send, you know, dozens of people, and they would either go back and forth themselves in, uh, in later times, but in earlier times, 
they would go and just stay because it was so hard to move. But it was, it was this global network of Chinese family connections that created these Chinatowns um, throughout <clears throat> the world, really, throughout the trading world um, around the Pacific, eventually the world, and it still exists. So the next part is um, what would happen if a volcano went off in Tambora in 1815, even in the, uh, the de Jong Bors uh, article that you read at the beginning of the course, um, there's reports in the historical record of the king of Java saying, we heard the sound and we thought it was military and we thought it was cannon fire. And so uh, we're not sure which volcano it was, but um, or eventually they find out it's a volcano in Tambora. But no matter what, it represents uh, a significant event, uh, an imbalance between heaven and earth. And so what do you do if you're the king of Java and you're responsible for the balance between heaven and earth? You do what you always do, is you have one of these uh, called Kira Pusaka, which means a parade of sacred objects. And so on the designated night, designated by the king, um, they take the holy objects out of the treasury of the palace. And these holy objects are chosen very carefully by the, the holy seers of the palace. They're chosen to, based on what has gone wrong what imbalance has occurred, and what, uh, tra what disasters are looming on the horizon if things aren't put back into balance. And so based on these predictions and these interpretations of events, they choose very specific objects that are imbued with specific characteristics for restoring balance. And they keep the objects themselves <coughs> secret, again, because this is strategic knowledge. They don't want people to panic. Uh, by knowing what the holy priests expect to happen next. And so um, they bless these objects, they clean these objects, they collect the water, because now the water that cleaned the objects is now holy. They cover them up, they bless them, they put these flowers on them, and they burn incense, and they choose specific priests to carry them forward. Um, and people walk in from... Uh, villages, you're supposed to walk, you're not supposed to take the bus, uh, but it depends on how far away your village is. But they come and they throng on either side of the streets. Um, I was part of four of these, uh, these ceremonies because they started, the, the president of Indonesia from 65 to 98 decided the palace should do this every year just to restore the balance between heaven and earth. So it was, became an annual event on the Javanese New Year's Eve, um, which changes the date every year because it's a lunar calendar. So I was able to witness this firsthand uh, four times. Um, and it involves um, carrying, this is a, a spear, a sacred spear. Um, uh, but it involves these white buffalo that know when they're needed and they wander down from the hills to the palace and they lead this procession. And if the buffalo stop, everybody stops. And if the buffalo go, everybody follows. If the buffalo run, everybody, we all pick up our skirts and try to keep up with the buffalo. And if the buffalo pee on the street, when the buffalo pee on the street, the young men scramble from the sidelines and they run out and they try to wipe up the pee off the street because it's sacred pee. It comes from the white buffalo. And similarly, when the buffalo perform number two, same thing. And you take it back and you put it in your rice fields and it does good things. And so my friend uh, made a movie that won an award um, where he documents some of these things. So this is preparing some of the rituals, some of the rituals that are required for uh, maintaining and restoring the balance between heaven and earth. 
one of my main tasks was to uh, repair and rebuild part of the sacred tower that I was one of the first people who wasn't the king was able to go up there. Um, but we replaced a lot of these columns as part of our work. Because <clears throat> the king said, this is the most important place. This is where every year on the anniversary of his coronation, he would go up and have sex with the queen of the South Seas to renew that spiritual uh, connection between this mythical goddess who lived under the ocean. <laughs> um, and so here's this procession. And you, so you take it from the center of the palace out through the gates, and you follow the buffalo uh, in this procession uh, counterclockwise around the palace and then back into the center. And that purifies the entire palace. And by purifying the palace, you are uh, uh, purifying the entire world. Yes? Yeah. Um, and princes, are they family members or like descendants of the king, or are they just? They are the sons and daughters of the king and his six wives. So is it is the firstborn like the um, heir to the throne? Or yes. When this king uh, that I worked with um, died in two thousand one, um, his son, there was a struggle for power, and his oldest son, who is insane and a criminal, um, locked himself into the palace and because possession of the palace was how you get power of the king, apparently. And so the, the, the basically he was barricaded into the palace and he never left for like four years. So do, is there ever a time where they, like, do they have to die for their to take over? Or is yes, okay. they have to die. So There's no like, retirement for the king. This guy was sharp as, as anything. He you know, uh, used to go to the gym and work out on the exercise cycle. And he, was, uh, he was coronated in uh, 1945 uh, uh, under Japanese rule. So there was a Japanese connection then. The Japanese invaded in 42. They kept the kings in power. Um, this king came to the throne in 45, and he died in 2001. Yes. So I know, like, um, besides, like, the tradition of, like, the white buffaloes walking down the streets, were there, like, any different kind of, I guess, uh, ceremonies that would happen? Like, um, maybe any sacrifices, or...? All the time. Okay. Uh, especially, uh, one of the Islamic holidays, you sacrifice a goat. I can't remember which one it is. Um, I think it's the ascension of Muhammad. Um, that goats, goats are tethered um, outside the house for a couple days before the holiday. And that says, we're going to sacrifice a goat here, or a buffalo if you're really rich. And if you can't afford your own goat or buffalo, and you're my neighbor, come to my house and partake in the blessings that accrue to anyone. Now, this is a, an Islamic celebration. Um, so the really fascinating thing about uh, this example is the melding of cultures, where you see Javanese animism that predated Hinduism, this Queen of the South Seas thing. That's not Hindu, Buddhist, it's not Islamic, it's animistic predating that. Then Hinduism sweeps through, and it gets all mixed together. And then in comes Islam. And you never give up anything. You just add these layers on top. And the Dutch come in. And now uh, this thing we call globalization, it's nothing new. It's just more of the same that's been happening for 2,000 years uh, since the original connections to the Chinese and the Indians uh, from South Asia. Um, so, uh, so all of these ceremonies are all happening uh, all the time. Yes. He also mentioned that there's Hindu and Islam. Do they have? Do they worship any other animals like elephants? Because I know elephants is 
Is the sacred animal of Hinduism? And yes, the Ganesh, um, definitely. There's not so much of that. They used to keep elephants as kind of a, uh, a, a signal of power and wealth. Um, that first gate that I showed you that kind of drew me in, that was where the elephants were kept. Um, and uh, it's, the whole neighborhood is named Elephant Place, um, Gajahan. And so that was, so elephants are part of it. But it's all mixed. And they don't, they're not contradictory. I, I would ask, what's the meaning of this column as eight things? And, so, and I'd get a Hindu explanation. You know, uh, the sunrise, the east is the source of all life, and then there's life, and then there's death, and that's, it's a Hindu set of symbols. And then I'd ask someone else just to confirm it, and they'd say, well, it's eight-sided, so it's the, um, and Muhammad lived uh, 64, that was eight groups of eight, so eight window. And so this is a Islamic, uh, this architectural ornamentation is an Islamic symbol, and it means this, 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 and this. And I would say, well, which one is it? To a third person, and say, why do you insist that it has to be one or the other? It's, it's not mutually exclusive. And so that was the attitude. And it was like, wow, pretty cool. So it allows all these things, these simultaneous translations that um, are now under threat um, with uh, waves of stricter Islam coming through that they see. Um, the king and the palace as a degenerate branch of Islam must be destroyed. So who knows what's going to happen. But when the Islam came through, it swept through Java. And anyone who wanted to keep uh, practicing the old ways without mixing Islam in, they went to this volcanic region in Java called Bromo and exist on the slopes of uh, this volcano that is still active and explodes all the time. Uh, right near the palace, uh, Gunung um, Rapi, uh, it, it uh, erupted two weeks after I climbed into the crater. And, uh, you know, and it wasn't until we were in the crater that the guide said, if you start to smell a really strong odor of sulfur, run as fast as you can back up to the rim, because it tends, sometimes it fills up with poisonous gases and people suffocate. So it's like, now you tell us. Because you know, we hiked up really fast and we got there before sunrise enough so that we could climb down, which not many people do. And we saw the orange glow through cracks in the rock of the actual flowing lava under the rock. And two weeks later, from the palace, you could see this in the distance uh, erupting. And right now in Bali, um, I was there with students in September, and there was a huge eruption in 63. But since 63, the main volcano on Bali was dormant and quiet and was down at threat level one or two the whole time. And then uh, on the Friday morning before we were leaving on Saturday, suddenly it went up to level three. And then on Saturday morning, uh, when we were heading towards the airport, it went up to four. And the last time it hit four, it, it blew up and uh, 2,000 people died and the airport was closed for weeks. And so uh, we were concerned. We were on the beach in Bali. There was the airport down the coast there. And then up there, you could see the volcano. And you could see the smoke billowing out of the volcano. And we're like, oh, God, I hope we can get on the plane here before this thing explodes and closes, closes the airport. Well, it, it held off um, until February, and then it absolutely let loose. And then a few weeks ago, it exploded again. And I think that's what this is. And Bali is one of the places where, um, let's see. Bali is one of the places where um, people, in, uh, if you wanted to keep practicing the Hindu Javanese uh, practice, religious practices without mixing Islam in, you had to either go to this Mount Bromo location or to Bali. So what we see in Bali now is a Hindu uh, set of practices that are much closer to what Java used to be before Islam came in in the 13th century. 
And this is the volcano erupting a few weeks ago in the night. And um, so the question is, uh, what do the Balinese do when a volcano erupts? Um, and so I have a little bit of that. And this is their, um, this is their ceremony uh, to restore the balance between heaven and earth after uh, the January eruption, <clears throat> which this version of it takes place at the, uh, at the coastline. And so they produce these offerings, and it takes several weeks to uh, make the things that are required by the ceremony. And then you parade it down to the beach, and you float it into the water. This, so this gets floated into the water. And it's a bunch of music. And I, I'm not sure if they altered the soundtrack on this one or not. But it's, the Balinese music is very startling and distinct. But the people who make these movies are constantly adding these bizarre soundtracks to it. So I just turned off the sound. But um, every ceremony involves uh, invoking the gods to protect the people as they enter a trance. Because the, there's this, the black and the white of these uh, sarongs symbolize the balance between good and evil. And it's not like American Hollywood movies where good vanquishes evil. That's not what it's about. It's about striking a balance between good and evil, because there's always good and there's always evil. And so in, when they go into these trances, it makes them susceptible to the evil uh, witch, Rhonda, who says, kill yourselves with these knives. Just pierce your own skin with these knives. But the evil witch, Rhonda, is counterbalanced by the good uh, lion god, Barong. And Barong protects them, makes their skin impenetrable. And so they go into trance. Uh, they try to kill themselves with their knives, but their skin is impenetrable. And so there's balance, you know, the Barong intervenes to protect them. And so this is this balance between good and evil. <clears throat> and so these things are still going on. And so it's not like Hawaii where you say, oh, isn't it a shame that the indigenous belief systems have all been displaced by Japanese, uh, the, milita the US military and tourism. Uh, the more money that comes in from tourism, the more money there is for bigger and more elaborate religious ceremonies, especially the cremation. Um, people will, will save up money their entire lives. And rather than uh, sending their children to college, uh, they will spend $40,000 on a cremation ceremony for their grandparents. So there's always someone, whoever's in trance, there's always a protector to keep them from falling down and hurting themselves. Um, but these things are still, you know, everyone in Bali is a member of an extended family that lives in a village. And membership in that village uh, requires that you uh, take part in these, um, in these religious ceremonies. Uh, it's an obligation. And so um, everyone is a farmer and a dancer, or an auto mechanic and a musician, or um, a tour guide and a painter. But everyone has this artistic, religious life that's outside of, um, in addition to their careers. And um, they're incredibly, the aesthetics of the island of Bali, is just, there's the volcano uh, that's erupting now in the distance. And everything is, they don't say north-south. They say towards the ocean and towards the volcano. And towards the volcano is the sacred direction because all water flows from uphill through the rice fields. It's the source of all wealth and bounty. It's one of the highest, uh, most intensely agricultural areas in the world because of the high population density uh, and the intense rice cultivation. And the control of water is determined by religious practices. At every gate of the water, there's a, um, a shrine controlled by a priest. And so it's the religious order, the hierarchy of the religion that controls 
um, the flow of water from upstream to downstream. And they tried, the UN came in, the World Bank came in, and they tried to control it with special scientifically produced seeds. And it worked great for two years, and then there was famine and, and death because it was incapable of striking the same balance that the religious practices uh, have been able to strike. Um, but architecture students who come to um, the graduate program um, have the choice between seven or eight different trips for two weeks, and one of them for the last three years has been to go to Bali. And so I've been taking students here where they get to um, dress up and go to some of these ceremonies. Um, and they're the only foreigners there because I've got the inside track. So that's it. Thank you. Now any questions? Questions, comments? So you're the translator for the king? Uh, between His Highness the Agra Khan and His Royal Highness the King. Okay, so only in like that one like In that one instance where when visitors come and they don't speak, there's no common language. Yeah. Your title was Architect to the King or something. Yeah, they, they were reluctant to give me, grant me official title, but for all intents and purposes, I was the Royal Architect. I'm, I was told by my partner, the prince. Um, and do you have a, a costume that you wear? Yes. I almost brought a part of it to show. I have the sashes, and I, I, I have the Balinese costume, and I have the Javanese costume. It shows my rank and hierarchy. Because the rules. Uh, apply to what pattern of batik you can wear as a skirt. So my skirt has a very specific pattern that I, I'm allowed to wear um, that other people couldn't wear. Yeah. You don't act as the royal architect anymore, correct? Correct. So I'm retired from that position. So would you still be able to wear the same pattern, or has that changed? Um, I'm not likely to push it. Um, because things are a mess there. I do go back. I designed a house for a performing arts center, and it's also a house the last few years. Um, I, I need to go back and see how it turned out. Um, but I don't think I would attend any palace function because I don't support the current king. I'm hoping he dies soon and sees what happens. He should go to jail. He, he's a pedophile. So is, um, is Indonesia, or maybe um, Bali or Java specifically, receiving a lot of population? I mean, is, it, is the population changing much um, at all? Or I'm just wondering whether um, people who uh, relocate there are able to um, acclimate to this stratification and, or, or is there a population that's sort of regarded as insufficiently um, pegged as to place and um, or is everyone sort of figured out? Well Bali is its own animal. Bali you either belong to a village or you're some kind of alien <coughs> presence. And if you do something really wrong, you get kicked out of your village, which is like death. It's just nothing could be worse. The rest of Indonesia, Indonesia isn't really a singular country or culture. It's really a collection of, depending on how you slice and dice, it's at least 400 distinct cultures, distinct language groups. Um, they try to distinguish between each other. They don't try to meld together. They actually make sure that they have a different language than the people on the other side of the mountain. And so even within local areas, you will speak the language of the adjacent town, uh, but not two towns away. You know, so you will, know, you will need to know like five languages, one for this town, one for that town, one for this town, one for that town. 
in some parts of Indonesia. Uh, Java is the size of California. It's got 160 million people. It's one of the most densely populated places on Earth. It's very different um, than Bali. Um, they don't care so much about the king uh, anymore. This is a cremation um, that still is a very important thing in Bali. But um, Java, you can exist uh, without speaking the local languages. Again. You just speak Indonesian. And uh, Jakarta is uh, really the end result of Batavia. It's not dominated by Javanese. It's not dominated by anyone. It's a complete mixture still of people from all over the place. And you just speak Indonesian there, um, unless you're with family and you speak your local language. And uh, you drive cars, and it's the second largest city in the world, depending on how you measure it. It will soon, what's the third largest? It will soon be the second largest. And eventually, it might overtake Tokyo and New Delhi to become the largest. It's 27 million now. So, um, it's just, uh, the traffic is horrible. I hate going there. Um, but it's a very modern place um, with all those problems. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.